Hi everybody, I'm Phil Liggett, they call me the voice of cycling and I was a special guest on episode 85 of the famous uh, Physical Performance Show which is approaching its 200th edition now in February 2020. I just want to say congratulations to all the guys involved. It's a great listen and I really enjoyed the small part I played in it. So here's to a very successful and happy new year. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Physiocrem and Pogo Physio. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll aim to bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. Of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, including expert editions, featured performers, coaches' corners, and interest editions. And on today's episode, this is the first expert edition for the calendar year 2020, and what a great way to start by featuring the many teachings and learnings from Dr. Nikki. The theme of today's conversation being hormones, health, and performance. And there are few medical professionals more qualified to speak on this topic than Dr. Nikki K. By way of bio, Dr. Nikki K is a UK based medical doctor with a specialization in sports endocrinology. Dr. Nikki K's clinical attachments include time spent at the Olympic Medical Center in Melbourne the Australian Institute of Sport, and the University of Geneva. As a research fellow at St. Thomas's Hospital, Dr. Nikki Kay was part of the international medical team that developed the test for growth hormone in the doping of athletes. It was during this time that the penny really dropped for Dr. K, where she recognized the importance of hormones in dictating athletic performance. With sports medicine grants, Dr. K went on to research the training effects on the endocrine system, resulting in publications in sports and dance endocrinology. Dr. K's recent work has looked at endocrinology in competitive male cyclists. Dr. K has published the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine's educational website, Health for Performance, in order to raise the awareness of relative energy deficiency in sports. Dr. K is also involved in the hashtag Train Brave campaign and currently works in the first NHS Red S dedicated clinic in London, the Enspire Clinic. Dr. K is a sought-after speaker and at the time of recording had just returned from the Barca or Barcelona Football Club Sports Nutrition and Innovation Conference. Now, you must get ready with a pen and paper for this expert edition. You'll hear from Dr. K on why hormones matter for athletes, the role that hormones play in mediating training adaptations, why energy availability is so paramount for athletes and performers, the consequences of low energy availability or relative energy deficiency in sports, fascinating findings from Dr. Nikki Kay's research in elite cyclists looking at their energy availability status and the surprise findings of many of their bone mineral density tests, the role of training, loads, nutrition and recovery on hormone health and performance, how and why energy deficiency can be both intentional and unintentional, why athletes need to fuel for the work required, why lighter is definitely not better when it comes to sporting performance, and how to move towards reversing relative energy deficiency in sports and the associated health consequences. There's tips in this episode for health professionals, coaches, and of course athletes. Here is my 
conversation on this expert edition, this all important topic, hormones, health and performance with Dr. Nikki Kay. Dr. Nikki Kay, this for me is a real professional thrill. So firstly, uh, welcome to the Physical Performance Show. And secondly, uh, thank you for your time. You've just returned from a conference and uh, you're hot back on the uh, on the education pathway. Yeah, listen, thank you so much for inviting me this year. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, yeah, can't wait to get stuck into some discussion. Thanks so much. Well, Dr. Nikki, before we you know discuss the topic of today's expert edition, which is really all things hormone health and performance for athletes, which feeds over to this concept of relative energy deficiency in sports or dance. Uh, let's get some context around your own interest in, uh, in dancing and the performing arts and sort of take us through to the current day as a, an endocrinologist uh, and uh, all the professional work that you now do? Yeah, well, I've always um, I've always loved dancing personally, been dancing since I was age four or whatever, and I've always been very keen about doing science at school, and so the combination was to study medicine because I always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to apply my knowledge to dancers, sports people. Um, And back then, I'm very old now, so this is a long time ago, uh, the main emphasis of sports medicine was injuries. But to my mind, I wanted to go something beyond that. Why were injuries, why, well, I mean, sometimes injuries are accidents and, you know, injuries happen. We we never stop them. But uh, to my mind, there was maybe something else before preceding an injury that was preventable, i.e. turning back the clock, what's happening to the person's hormones. Of course, we train in order to tap into our hormones. But if your hormones aren't playing ball because you haven't got that, you know, the optimal periodization of your training, nutrition, recovery, whether you're a dancer or athlete, then, you know, your hormones aren't going to be firing on all cylinders and therefore you're going to have certain problems. And so that was always kind of my concept, you know, as a sort of a junior doctor. Um, And eventually I was building up more experience, expertise, including I was just telling you about coming over to Australia when I was newly qualified, doing a little tour of the sports medicine clinics, Uh, just sort of building up the experience, always dancing myself. Uh, My family are keen athletes, uh, swimmers. They did the the classic transition swimmers, triathlon <laughs> one stuck with triathlon the other one's now uh, a cyclist road race cyclist and a cycle coach so you know i've always been surrounded by people that were doing exercise and i just wanted to see what i could input to them from from the endocrine point of view and professionally uh you're not just a frontline clinician you are also you know quite quite prolific and prominent in uh in the the space of this concept of energy deficiency which we'll dive deep on today so where did the research interest start first start to emerge for you well i was very lucky i was offered uh i actually went for a job interview for a sort of a a sort of a straightforward as it were endocrine post at st thomas's hospital london and At first, I was disappointed because the professor said, no, we don't, we're not going to offer you that job. But he said, but I've got another job that which will suit you better. And they was like, oh, great. And that was doing research into developing an anti-doping test for growth hormone. So that's which really sort of set me off on, gave me ideas for research because hormones, like I just said earlier, are so important for performance. And unfortunately, the downside of that is that 75% of uh, adverse analytical findings in doping tests are hormones. And at the time, there wasn't a robust test for growth hormone. So that uh, that sort of set me or got my interest in research. So I did that bit of research. And at the same time, the professor was very kind. And he said, I know you're a dancer and you've got you want to do some research on dancers so you can have a little bit of sort of protected time as it were for doing your research in dancers. So um, I did, that was when I did my first dance study on retired dancers. And then I thought, well, let's look at the other end of the spectrum, look at the young dancers in training, a three year longitudinal study. Um, And then from, from then it was just like, wow, in order to be a good clinician, well, you know, we need the research, we need the uh, evidence for, you know, what are the best 
ways of managing um, various conditions in, in the sports person or relating to hormones. And so then that led me on to more recently doing that study of male cyclists. I think we might discuss all that a bit more. Um, yeah. And then, uh, you know, my next sort of goal is to develop uh, sports specific questionnaires for um, for being in low energy availability, i.e. the risk of REDS. Because realistically, we can't go around doing DEXA and blood tests on every single person doing exercise, you know. It's not practical. But if we can have some sort of screening questionnaire, uh, but I think, uh, personally, I think it's got to be sport specific because the sort of questions I would be asking a male cyclist are going to be totally different to what I'm going to ask a female dancer, right? So I think it's got to be tailored. And the best way, and or if you're passionate about whatever your sport is, you want to talk about that. So dealing with that first, asking first, you know, training load, all the things to do with their sport, that's sort of going to warm them up, if you will. And then you can ask more sensitive questions, shall I say, about periods, attitudes to nutrition and things like this. So that's my next sort of objective. Well, as a frontline clinician, uh, I will be, uh, as will uh, many of uh, my colleagues and yours, be waiting for that screening questionnaire or, or the template for that, uh, Nikki. So uh, keep pushing on with your, with your great work. A couple of things just emerged from what you shared that I think are of interest. It was early days when you were developing tests around detecting growth hormone in athletes that I yep. guess you made the connection of, as you just stated, how important hormones, hormone health, if you wanted to term it that, are, is important, how that's important for an athlete and performance. And I've heard you say in preparing for today that training is one thing. The athlete can do the training, that the performer, the dancer can do the, do the work, but it's the hormones the milieu of the hormones that determines the adaptations that ensue. So can you maybe do a little uh, endocrinology 101? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's all about eff effective, efficient training, isn't it? Because, you know, you can slog up and down the, the pool. Oh, I love swimming in the 50-meter pool in Sydney, by the way. Anyway, um, you know, uh, you have lots of 50-meter pools in Australia. I'm really super jealous. Anyway, you can put in all the training hours you want, but – you know, you want the reason you're training is because you become fitter, you become better next time you go to a training session or when you turn up to your race. But that's, you know, what is actually driving those adaptations to exercise? Uh, and when do they occur? It's actually when you rest. So you go and do, say, a swim session. And it's actually then when you stop within the 30 minute window, you have your carbohydrate and protein, of course. Um, and, you know, you're going to have a rest, especially during sleep, sleep, and exercise are the two main stimuli, for example, for growth hormone release. Um, and it's when you're resting that the hormones really snap into action. They've been sort of stimulated a little bit from your exercise. And there are the key hormones like growth hormone, uh, you know, many others, all the reproductive hormones also, by the way, not just for reproduction. We're talking uh, testosterone and estrogen, of course, for the male and the female. Those and why, what they do, the hormones go into the nucleus and they um, direct the expression of DNA to synthesize proteins. The proteins in order to strengthen the muscles, all this sort of thing, make more enzymes so you can deal with lactic acid, all this sort of thing. So that's why, two points to this, you get fitter when you're actually resting after a train, you've done your training. It's actually, it's not whilst you're doing the training, you're getting fitter. It's during the rest afterwards, the rest of recovery, sleep. And it's hand in hand because the hormones are snapping into action, uh, bringing about all those adaptations so that when you turn up for your next session, you will be a little bit higher. So that's why the, you know, the classic sort of graph of getting fitter, you do a, uh, you actually sort of decrease in fitness actually while you're, you know, one should immediately once you've done your training, because the body's in a little bit of a state of a shock. Uh, and the stress, but it's actually then it bounces back up when you're recovering, so that the next time you you train, you're fitter. So that's so basically, um, hormones drive the adaptations, and those adaptations occur during rest and recovery. So that's why athletes, you know, have to. That's part of the training schedule. It's not the training; it's the training and the recovery. They have to go hand in hand. And I mean, this opens up the algorithm of uh, of training adaptation performance which is so multifactorial but this I guess uh, Nikki points to the fact that 
there can be times when that process is working well and there can be times where that process of adaptation isn't working well. So maybe before we explore the isn't working well side of things, uh, can we talk about what it looks like when it is working well? What happens? We go and, as you say, we, we do some training, we recover, there's adaptations. What hormones are firing off and what's an ideal sort of state of, of being? So certainly the growth hormone, especially when you're asleep, uh, like I said, that's for body composition. Um, testosterone in men, uh, that's why men have a higher hemoglobin and have more muscle uh, body composition-wise than women. Um, estrogen, if estrogen uh, you know, is in women, that's good for bone health, and actually it uh, mitigates against soft tissue injury. So that's something important. So um, although, you know, we've heard a lot about the female cycle recently and athletes where it stops, et cetera, and those are good examples. When it does stop, you know, they're getting stress fractures and injuries. So basically in the in the woman, the sort of, it's the variation. It's always the variation. Hormones vary. They're meant to. They're not just a straight line. They go up and down. It's actually those changes that um, are important for the body. As you know, the body responds to changing stimuli. So if you do the same exercise, I get told off for this. My son says I'm such an age group where I always do exactly the same swim session. Hey, anyway, um, <laughs> if, you do the same, if you give your body the same look, it gets bored. So the same thing with the training and the hormones. They've got to be in synchrony. So different types, so polarized training we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, periodization, that means different times when you're doing different intensities of exercise and you're having some easier weeks and harder weeks, etc. So mixing it up and then the hormones in turn will do what they're meant to do, vary. So the key ones are the growth hormone, the reproductive hormones, like I've just said, the testosterone and estrogen, um, metabolic flexibility. There's a lot of talk about that so that the athlete is able to use different sources of fuels. Okay. Um, uh, wow. Uh, so I think those are really the main ones. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to get too sort of like back to biochemistry days, otherwise it will be a bit dull. But, <laughs> but I think in, in summary, it's, it's, those are the key principles. Yeah. Your training has got to be periodized and polarized. And then in turn, your hormones will vary as they're meant to. And that, that and therefore drive your adaptations. If you're always doing the same thing, uh, that's you're not going to get so fit. You have to uh, mix it up. And Nikki, I've heard you reference, you know, a triangle that affects hormone health. Mm. If you so simply phrase it that, uh, you know, where as you just said, the training loads or the the type of training, periodized, polarized, whatever we want to term it, is, is one of those variables. But then, can you speak to this sort of simple framework, which I think is beautiful in its simplicity of the factors that affect hormone health. Yeah, well, the good news is that unless you've got a medical condition and an endocrine problem per se, the good news is to a certain extent you can take control or you can, you know, uh, get your hormones to work for you, if I can put it that way. So the three key behavioral things under your control are the training load, like we just went into, um, the recovery period, We've said how important that is. That's when the hormones really kick into action and nutrition. So you have to fuel appropriately. Fuel for the work required um, is the quote that um, colleague uh, James Morton at Liverpool Moors, he was the chief nutrition guy for Team Sky. So this concept of fueling for the work required, because if you are varying your training, then, of course, you're going to have to slightly tweak uh, your nutrition uh, to coordinate with that. So those, so that is the good news. It gives, it sort of gives empowerment to the athlete to know that look, these are things that you are in control of. There isn't a magic wand. Um, you know, don't resort to doping or something. You can, you know, uh, uh, integrate these factors. So it was the training load, nutrition, and the recovery. Those are the three key things. And to get those, in, uh, as I say, integrated periodization is the term I use, like to use. And that, in turn, will ensure uh, healthy hormones. Integrated periodization. It's a mouthful, but uh, I think, in, uh, in some, you know, as you just shared, it's, uh, the good news is, as you just quoted, you can get your hormones to work for you. Quite, exactly. Positive. Yep. Awesome. And uh, 
I mean, the body has such a remarkable knack of typically getting it right. Um, so, you know, you mentioned recovery period. Obviously, the, the big, a big factor there is sleep, Nikki. Mm-hmm. So anything, I mean, how does the recreational athlete, performer, dancer, any insights from, you know, your professional vantage point of how someone can start to determine if they're potentially sleep deprived? Um, I mean, those terms of uh, fatigue and freshness. I mean, actually, just wellness scores, just giving yourself a sort of do your own internal check, if you will, is actually, it sounds so simple, but it's, you know, actually quite, it's been shown actually to mirror quite closely what your hormones are like, because the person that knows your body best is you. (laughs) So if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling really, you're, you're not refreshed from your sleep, you're feeling sluggish, maybe you're feeling a little bit of a sore throat or something like that. So basically you're fatigued. So don't go out for that high intensity, uh, whatever it is, training session that you were intending on doing. Because if you do, um, you know, it it could backfire. You could actually make yourself worse if you're sort of harboring uh, some fatigue there and you, more to the point, you won't get the advantage. So just doing a very simple, I mean, this is really old school, but when I was doing competitive swim training, every morning we used to do resting heart rate and we used to, you know, make a little note of how we were feeling. So some of those good old fashioned things, just how are you feeling? Do a check, be honest with yourself. Do you, How have you felt you've slept? Do you feel fresh in the morning? Are you feeling fatigued? All those sorts of things that will give you an eye. I know there are all sorts of apps you can use to monitor your sleep and all that sort of thing. Fine if you want to spend your money on that, but um, you know, sometimes the good old fashioned. And you're the best control. You are your own control, so you can be honest with yourself how you're feeling. And you know that fits so beautifully with a uh, prior guest Shona Halson from who ran the Australian Institute of Sport Recovery Centre for yep. for you know as you probably know for for dec- uh, for sorry uh, many Olympic cycles and. You know, she really points to the not forgetting the the, beauty, the simplicity of subjective data, but the power of it as well through our mood, as you say, and just understanding. Yeah, some for, people and everyone is slightly different. Mm. Um, you know, some people are kind of more of a <laughs> negative outlook on things, and some are more positive. So, uh, you know, the, it's the scale for you how you're feeling. So, yeah, I know their work is excellent. So, you know, sometimes just going back keeping it simple, you know, good uh, sleep hygiene, as they call it, you know, don't look at your iPhone last thing at night. That's my failing. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the hot milky drink, it's got tryptophan in, it will uh, help uh, synthesize melatonin, the sleep hormone, you know, these old fashioned things, um, you know, just sort of winding down before bed and all that sort of thing. You know what, uh, sometimes just keeping it straightforward and simple like that with a whole load of f- fancy gadgets, yeah. um, you know, that sometimes is the best starting point anyway. And, you know, you mentioned one of these other behaviours is fueling for the work required as per your, you know, your sky cycling uh, colleague there. I guess the question is, and this is something I've really been challenged with in my work, how do you know when an athlete is fueling for the work that's required? And on preparing for today, it's really made me think, you know, you have a, say an endurance athlete, a cyclist or athlete runner whose workload, you know, might increase from eight hours a week to say 16. There's 16 hours of training. But, you know, if we look at the behavior triangle that you've got there, then there better be a, a doubling of, uh, of energy availability. Yet yeah, yeah. Our, our eating behaviors often don't change, you know, because it's kind of the way we do things. And so it immediately throws up this potential for there being a, a deficit in, in available energy. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just to maybe we should just say what we mean about energy availability. Yes. So just so everyone's clear what that is. So um, obviously we get all the energy we need from the food we eat, right? So that's uh, obvious. Um, and from that, the from the energy from your food, that's partitioned into number one, the priority is to cover the training load, whatever it is, uh, whether you're going on your four-hour bike ride or your uh, one-and-a-half-hour swim, your one-and-a-half-hour uh, ballet class, whatever it is. So that bit of energy goes straight off, prioritized to cover your training. And then the residual energy – um, that's what is. That's what we mean by energy availability. Energy availability for maintaining health. Okay. So um, 
when you were at school, people may have learned about the se the seven vital life processes, you know, excretion, respiration, all those. So basically, the energy is similar to the uh, resting metabolic rate. So if you were to lie in bed all day and not do any anything at all, you still need a quite a lot of energy, okay? And especially if you've got a high lean ma uh, uh, lean mass. So men who've got more muscle, those are more. That's more metabolically active. So I think that's often what people forget that. Um, yes, you actually you need a certain amount of energy for your training, and you know there are lots of things like Strava you can work out how many calories roughly, roughly for example, and that's a lot for a for a three hour cycle ride. But actually, don't forget to factor in that you actually just need some energy just to keep you ticking over for the rest of the day. Plus, people often have active jobs, physios, doctors walking around, teachers walking around. Um, you know, if you've got an active job that me needs movement as well, then actually, when you top that all up, that's often a lot more than you think. Um, you know, listen, if we, if you're a little bit under one day now and then, it's not going to be major. The body, as you say, is very adaptable. It will cope. But if you sustain that over a long time, low energy availability, day on, day on, then, then you get a cumulative deficit, you see, and then the body's not so happy and, and it gets into a stressful situation. So, um, and the other thing I think to uh, point out is that it's almost like a, you also, you've got to think about uh, fueling prospectively. You're not fueling, of course, you've got to have your, like we discussed, your recovery drink within 30 minutes of stopping your training. And, you know, uh, but actually you're preparing, your evening meal is actually pr preparing you for the next day's training. So the, the thing that lots of athletes mistake they sometimes make is, oh, I'm on a rest day, so I don't have to eat so much today, they might think, especially for the triathletes and the cyclists that want to be a little bit leaner and the dancers, um, you know, think, oh, well, I'm having a rest day. I don't, you know, I don't need so much to eat so much, but they've forgotten that actually they're eating for the next day. So that's why it's a sort of looking forward to how we, and that's what the concept of fueling for the work required. So if you know, even if it's a rest day, if you know that the next morning you've got high intensity, you know, uh, like a four hour cycle ride, actually that evening you should be getting in the stocks so that your glycogen levels are replete in your liver and your muscles. Because my son's a cycling coach and he did a lovely little calculation. He's also an engineer, so he loves his sons. Anyway, <laughs> he did a little calculation. And, you know, to do um, a really tough uh, cycle, either road race for a couple of hours, two hours, or a really, uh, you know, a long ride for four hours or something, actually, you don't have enough glycogen. So you're going to run low. So number, so for sure you need it topped up before you start the ride, and for sure you need to be taking on fuel as you're riding. So I think that um, it's a, a sort of a flexibility of mind because I fall into this trap myself. You know, we all like our schedules, especially if you're a tri if you're a, an athlete. You know, you got your schedules, this session, that session. I have my dance classes here, here, here. You know, and I, uh, you know. I have to stick with that, but sometimes the mentality can also spill over into the nutrition. It's like, oh, this is what I always eat, blah 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 blah. But actually, remember, it's got to be it's got to be flexible. It's got to be that integrated periodization. I like that word, <laughs> that term. So you've got to be flexible uh, and be thinking ahead in terms of your nutrition and your training, and and therefore your recovery. Yeah. So you know, thinking ahead, uh, being flexible versus rigid, as you say, sometimes the. Yep the very people that are attracted to, you know, a pursuit as such as performance dance or triathlon or cycling. I mean, they're often uh, observation wise, quite type A, you yeah. know, they, they like to put yeah, A yeah. plus B equals C. And so, so, th so that's really, really interesting that we need to be thinking ahead. And I think I'd put my hand up as often being guilty of that. Say, as you mentioned, our, our work life, I'm on my feet, seeing people sort of all day, most days. And, uh, and sometimes you forget to eat lunch, which <laughs> probably isn't ideal. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, and as you say, you could probably get away with that over one day. But I look back professionally, I, I did that for a good 10 years plus and, and found out, as I mentioned just before we started recording, just several years ago, that my bone density at 36 was low in my spine and hips. And I then reflected, gosh, how much I wasn't intentionally avoiding food, but unintentionally through my work, plus early starts and training both sides yep. of the day for marathons. How unintentionally did that have an effect? Well, I think you made two really important points. The first one being that if you are 
um, a successful athlete or dancer, like you say, you, you, it's because you have those personality traits. Perfectionism, a little bit obsessive maybe, maybe a little bit rigid, all those words, which actually are very laudable qualities. And that gets you, that gets you, that gets you places in life, right? Okay? Driven, all those things. But, but that can also mean a little bit rigid as well. And if that spills over into the nutrition, then that, you know, that can be a problem. And the other thing is, like, like you said, this can be unintentional. So you can be in low energy availability just like by mistake, frankly, because you've got a very high training load. You know, you have to, if you're trying to get in a double session, that's inevitably going to be one in early in the morning, one later in the evening. I used to do competitive swimming. Yep, that was hell. Um, so, and you've got a busy job as well then, you know, suddenly you turn turn around and think, oh, goodness, yes, I was unintentionally in low energy availability. Those are the people, athletes, that sometimes if you pick it up early, it's pretty straightforward to, you know, point it out to them. And they was like, oh, I didn't realize that. Fine. No, you know, I'll change it up. But the intentional ones are a little bit more of a tr tricky situation because they have those characteristics of being um, driven, a little bit obsessive, perfectionist, sensitive, all those things. And they're probably in a sport where it's perceived that being lightweight is a performance advantage. But the thing is up to an extent. I mean, listen, if you're getting into your cycling uh, in your 40s, and frankly, maybe you are a little bit overweight, so losing a teeny bit of weight isn't such a bad thing. I do lots of type 2 diabetic clinics, so, you know. But if you are already a lean cycler, say you're in your 20s and you're already lean and you want to be leaner and you intentionally go out to try and do that and you're training a lot, that's when you can run into problems. So, um, you know, it gets to a tipping point where the body isn't happy that you're under fueling it. Um, and that's when uh, that's the situation of REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, the intentional sort, which is um, quite tricky because now you've got to try and unpick the person's belief system and, um, you know, try and help them find a better way. And the belief system often, you know, on loop is that message that to be lighter is going to equate to better yeah. performance, uh, which you see in aesthetic sports as a component. There's been some well-publicized yep. recent, you know, cases exactly. in the world of cases. running, exactly. Yep, which is, I think, great in terms of bringing awareness to this. Um, but uh, lighter doesn't equal better performance. And certainly if that lighter has come at a cost of necessarily come at a cost of being in energy deficit for a period of time. So one of your, you know, your research uh, papers looked at this in cyclists. Can you share a little bit about the link between cyclists that were in energy deficient state and, and their performance? Yep. As a clinician, and you probably see this as well, the problem I come up against is that the athlete frankly, has got intentional reds. In other words, they are intentionally under fueling because they think that lighter is, is better. And actually, you know, in the short term, initially, um, you know, it might be true because losing a little, you know, being a little bit lighter maybe isn't such, you know, they get away with it, if I can put it like that. It's a short term gain because the cortisol is high, they're high on stress hormone, they're buzzing, they've achieved their goal, they're performance driven. They've achieved their goal of losing X amount or X amount of fat or weight or whatever it is, okay? But then the ironic situation is the body um, isn't stupid. It's like, well, I can't sustain, I can't keep losing weight like this. So what the body does, it, it downregulates the metabolic rate, so it slows down the thyroid uh, gland. And so now the athlete gets frustrated because even though they're eating less, they're not losing any more weight. Their weight is stable because the body adapts. So, but the athlete interprets that. This is talking about belief system that they're not they're not being strict enough on themselves. So you can see that gets into a vicious circle. If they're in a low energy availability state, their hormones are going to be a little bit all over the shop, like I've discussed. And actually, now they can't make really good decisions. They've convinced themselves, and their neurotransmitters aren't working, that their way is the right way. Um, but I can sit there, um, you know, and say, look, you're going to get uh, problems with your bone health. You're, you know, you're not going to be as good as you as you want to be. Um, your hormones aren't working. But sometimes it's difficult to convince. But the thing that will convince the athlete or the dancer is the performance. So that's why 
although there's been a, quite a lot of research on REDS, um, you know, and it's very interesting from the clinical point of view, low bone density as a result, lots of injuries and things like this. But unless the athletes had that wake up call, for example, cyclists won't very unlikely to get stress injuries because um, surrounded by a family of cyclists, I know they're either on their bike or they're on the sofa. That's it. They never walk or run. They avoid it like the plague. So they're not going to get a stress, a bone stress injury like a runner, for example. So they won't have a warning, early warning sign. Um, and in my study, uh, you know, I was trying to unpick this uh, and you know sort of prove it. Does it really affect the performance? And yes, it does. Was the answer um, in those cyclists that persisted in restricting what they were eating in the belief that lighter is better. Actually, compared to the cyclists who did take on board my suggestions and, you know, uh, fuel for the work required and do some skeletal loading exercises, actually, the difference in performance between those two groups was uh, in terms of race points. In the UK, we have British cycling race points. And uh, it was the difference in performance of 95 British cycling race points. And in uh, in British cycling terms, what that means is going from one category to another. So I don't know if you have cycling categories there. You must do. So, for example, in, our, in, in the UK, we have fourth cat is fourth category is like you've just started cycling. Third category is like you're doing a few races. Second category, you have to get, I think it's 100 BC race points. And then to move up to the next one, you need another 100, etc., like that. Um, and so the number of points I'm talking about is what you require to move from one category to the next. And that's, you know, that's really important. And so that my research showed that actually there is a performance effect adverse or ad advantageous, depending if you get your nutrition right, um, in terms of race performance in male cyclists. And that was unique because there have been some studies in female athletes showing that there is a difference um, in terms of performance. Not so good if, you, if you're not fueling enough. And it was female swimmers actually on 400 meter time. Um, but nothing really in the males and nothing really concrete in terms of race performance. So I'm hoping that that will you know, make people, the athletes listen a bit more. It's not just me going on because, you know, I love my hormones and, you know, I'm banging on about this. It's actually what they're trying to achieve is they want to perform better. So if they are aware that this, not paying attention to this will have adversely affect their performance. Um, and conversely, if you do address it, then guess what? You can improve your performance. So, you know, it's all about the performance. So if we can make, do more research like this, which I'm hoping to do to, to really, uh, pin down what it is uh, and, you know, quantify the performance differences, um, then hopefully that will make more athletes and dancers, you know, uh, realize this is something really important, something not to be ignored. And in terms of evidence, uh, Nikki, there for the dancing population um, performers, I've heard you cite that, you know, decreased uh, coordination might not be the right word but you can have dec decreased performance through your ability to i guess coordinate slash even think rationally and clearly make decisions yeah so there was a study uh by anna merlin in denmark on uh it was athletes not dancers but nevertheless same idea um and those athletes that weren't having periods, in other words, amenorrheic, um, compared to the uh, athletes that were regularly menstru menstruating, eumenorrheic, there was a difference um, in terms of, uh, as you say, their coordination, their neuromuscular skills, reaction time, uh, the peak strength, the, you know, one, uh, one rep max, all those sorts of things. Um, but if you think about the sort of athlete um, that might be amenorrheic. We're talking dancers, we're talking gymnasts because they might be susceptible to reds because they're aesthetic sports. Those are the, exactly the sports where you absolutely need your neuromuscular skills nailed because that's a long way to fall from the top bar, um, asymmetric bars. I can tell you, I've done it. It's a long way and you can injure yourself nastily. And the same for dancers, you know, on point. Um, you know, you have to be absolutely spot on your balance. If you're not, you're going to go over on your ankle you know, it's not going to end well, shall we say. And they may already have weak bones or thinner bones, uh, and, you know, suboptimal bone health. So if you fall over, it's even more of a risk you might get a fracture or a serious injury. So for the females, that coordination thing, um, aspect of it, I think you make a very good point. And that's really super important. And you know, the irony of that is these are 
athletes, performers who spend hours upon hours and the difference from a, a good, well-performed, executed routine or, or mm. move to not might be selection into uh, a dance academy or, or otherwise. Exactly. So it is, it is ironic if we talk about it rationally like this, it seems, seems like, well, obvious, but because of this concept, lighter is faster or in the dance world or performance thinner gets you selected or gets you more marks. And that's one of the things I'm doing at the moment with a dance survey, seeing what the perception is. If the dancers are reporting that they think they believe their belief system is that they will get selected if they look thinner is, but actually is the reality, is that really the reality? I agree with you. I think actually, surely it's more on how you perform the move. It's not, I mean, you know, otherwise they would just have everyone that was thin and not necessarily a good dancer. So it gets a little bit crazy, but also just going back to that other point you made about um, thinking rationally and good judgment what I can say is, uh, in particular, there was a dancer I worked with recently who had the belief system, like we just said, that, you know, thinner was better and her periods had stopped, et cetera. Uh, and actually, she was in a really bad place in, in mood-wise. She was pretty depressed. But then, you know, uh, eventually she got back on track. Her periods restarted. She was fueling for the work required. And the main thing she said to me and she smiled. The first time when I saw her, she smiled. So it's like, I know you're feeling better. And she said, now in class, I can pick up the corrections more quickly. Because when you do a dance class, you know, the teacher fires um, choreography at you. It's like, do this, that, blah, blah, blah. You have to pick it up quickly. And you have to pick up the corrections. They say, oh, you need to, you know, whatever it is, point that foot more or something. But if you haven't got those coordination skills and you haven't got the quick thinking decisions, then, of course, you're not going to be able to execute that. So that, for her, uh, I think you make a very good point. For some sports, which have to have really fine-tuned neuromuscular skills, so dancing, uh, you know, gymnastics, all those things, um, you know, you absolutely need your hormones and your neurotransmitters so you can uh, be on the ball um, and be coordinated and all those, uh, all those things. Yeah, so these can really determine in terms of the pointy end of performance uh, careers. And, you know, I, <laughs> I, I see in endurance sports, there's, there tends to be mm. two clusters of, of athletes, the, the boom busters who are, tend to be on a cycle of injury or the builders who can yep. stay injury free and season upon season build, you know, into the, into their best versions of themselves as athletes, and you know, so we just mentioned that in terms of selection from a performing arts side of side of things. But then on the endurance sport or any sport in pursuit, if you can back up consistent seasons without bone injuries or whatever it may be, then uh, yep. you know you're going to get closer to that that sporting potential. And Nikki, it makes me think also of. In the running world, Ryan Hall, American record holder for the marathon, sub-205 marathon record, and he, he cites that when he wanted to get Kenyan lean, in his words, and he really mm-hmm. stripped down, his performance suffered. And then when he realized it wasn't for him, took on more fuel, got back to his, his better sort of uh, racing state, uh, mm-hmm. he, he, he broke the American record that still hasn't been touched. So I think that's a great example in the running space. Yeah, exactly. And also we have to bear in mind everyone is different. I mean, if you, you know, for a, a white American to try and convert himself to a Kenyan runner, I mean, they've got different, you know, there's going to be different genetics, physiology, all that sort of thing. So, um, you know, don't compare yourself to... I often get that, oh, the athlete or the dancer says, oh, but so-and-so, uh, you know, is eating one lettuce leaf a day and they're very good and whatever. It's like, well, I don't think that's really probably true, but and in any case, everyone is slightly different. So, you know, your own, you know, personalized uh, nutrition, training, know yourself. Like we said, be honest with yourself, your own subjective measures, what's going on, what works for you. So that, you know, there are some general guiding principles, undoubtedly, you know, fuel for the work required and all this sort of thing. But if you try and stick to some, uh, just because someone else does it, doesn't mean it's going to translate to you. Because in the cycling world, there was a little bit of a, um, how should I put it, uh, controversy or, or misunderstanding or whatever. Chris Froome a few years ago posted that for his breakfast he was having, uh, I think it was avocado and smoked salmon. So suddenly everyone in the cycling world, well, a lot of people, shall I say, the aspiring amateurs, 
all said, oh, well, Chris Froome never, never eats carbohydrates. They made assumptions. Oh, he never eats carbohydrates. And secondly, that's why he's so skinny and that's why he wins the Tour de France. So I don't think that quite, you know, listen, if it was that easy and we just all ate avocados for breakfast, would be multiple, everyone would be winning the Tour de France. You see, so you see what I mean? It's in context. Actually, he clarified that it was on the particular day when he was doing an easy session. So that's why he was doing a slightly lower, he was doing periodized carbohydrate, you see. So it was because it was for him personally, part of his training cycle had been taken out of context. Uh, you see what I mean? Yeah. So that that is really, that's the problem. People take things out of context. Oh, it applies to someone else. Um, so, you know, work for someone else must work for me, all this sort of thing. You have to be quite, you have to be quite brave and courageous and you have to be, you know, um, listen to your own body and, and figure out what, what works for you, what doesn't. And certainly if, uh, if, if uh, your day to day doesn't get your attention, then your performances will paint a good picture of, uh, you know, of you know if you're going in the right direction or not. As as you just as just you just outlined there, Nikki. Uh, chronologically, I find this quite fascinating. The evolution of the concept. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, when I was a junior triathlete in the '90s, it, you know, I remember hearing about the female athlete triad and. Uh, and you know, then going on to learn about further about it at university, and thinking, ah, oh, the female athlete triad. So that can happen to females, where you know the the balance is uh, the energy availability isn't there. I didn't even have those terms in my vocabulary. But basically, I used to think they've overtrained, yeah. they start to lose yeah. their, their menstruation cycle regularity. Yeah. It affects their bone health, and and on it goes. And it did not even cross my radar that this could be something that males will have to encounter. Um, so can you tell, walk through the chronology, uh, Barbara Drinkwater looking at collegiate runners eating, you know, uh, back in the 80s, I think it might have been. So can you just go through in simple terms yeah. the bullet point chronology to our current understanding of this concept of reds? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. It started with the female athlete triad and Barbara Drinkwater and her collegiate runners, um, those runners that had a higher weekly mileage. Um, as you say, we didn't have that terminology, low energy availability, but effectively that what it, that's what it was because they had a higher energy demand. And so therefore, uh, cause they were running more. And so they didn't have enough energy in the system. Therefore their periods switched off and they got weaker bones. I mean, that was the sort of like, um, the stark thing, osteoporosis, amenorrhea, um, disordered eating or eating disorder even. But then now we realize uh, that evolved into there's a spectrum. So it can be really serious like that, or it could be somewhere in between. That's the subtle difference between disordered eating and an eating disorder. Disordered eating means just being a bit bit finicky, a bit orthorexic, maybe avoiding carbs or something. But an eating disorder is like sort of, you know, really uh, big psychological overlay. But, you know, there's a spectrum now of the female athlete triad, ranging from women who are regularly menstruating and fueling sufficiently. For example, Gwen Jorgensen, she posted all her uh, menstrual cycles on Training Peaks a few years ago. You know, uh, so it is possible to get it right. And her bones are fine. She's got a baby. So that all worked out well. Um, but then, you know, for females, there is this slippery slope. Um, and I think the reason why it started off as a female athlete triad is because there's an obvious clinical sign for women menstrual cycles so it's pretty obvious and you don't have to do any fancy tests it's have you got periods yes no (laughs) you see what i mean so i think i think that's why it started with the females because there's an obvious clinical sign um but then you're absolutely right it's kind of uh you know that was that was excluding half the population just saying oh it's female athlete triad and so that's why the concept of REDS was developed um, by the IOC, and that was published in the BJ Sim in 2014. That's when it started. So relatively recently, um, which to my mind is quite shocking. But anyway, normally the women get you know the the hard deal in the sense <laughs> that most of us. I've just written a blog called uh, uh, "Of My Cements" on the BJ Sim, saying that basically most of the studies, and especially in sports science, they're on men. So, you know, women are being hard done by. But this is one example. Reds were actually, it was the other way around. Started off in the women, the men were being excluded. Um, and then, as you say, things, so we realize, of course, if you think about it, of course men are going to be affected, especially the male cyclists, because they've got a double whammy. They've got, they're not loading their skeleton. I'm just looking at that lovely cycling picture behind you of cyclists. They're not loading their skeleton. 
Uh, so their bones aren't going to be that happy uh, compared to, especially the multi-directional, you know, uh, football or something like that, or Australian rules, you're changing direction all over the time. So cyclists aren't are going to be at a disadvantage from that point of view, but also from, uh, you know, the fueling point of view, um, you know, there's no denying if you're a road, road cyclist going up a steep hill, uh, you know, being on the lighter end of the spectrum is better. Um, although my husband recently looked at all the data, and actually the pro cyclists, they're not super, super skinny. Their BMI, average BMI is 21, 22. So they're not skinny, skinny. But anyway, um, so uh, especially the male cyclists, and there are stories we know. Chris Boardman, uh, you know, multiple uh, record holder, Olympic champion, he started off on the track. And as a track cyclist, you're on the flat going round and round in that ellipse. So your main thing you've got to overcome is air resistance, aerodynamic drag. But when you when he converted to being a road cyclist, now he's got to contend with gravity because he's got to go up hills. So he describes in his autobiography quite eloquently how he intentionally went to lose weight and got a little bit obsessed with his training, would always do that extra, literally the extra miles. Um, and he retired in his early 30s with osteoporosis. So, you know, it was going on already, but we just didn't recognize it or realize it or whatever it was. So that's why I'm really pleased about Reds. I mean, there's still a bit of controversy about the person. Um, there's, uh, there is still a sort of an old school camp that is just saying, oh, female athlete triad, and there isn't the evidence for males. Uh, but I mean, from a clinical perspective, and I'm sure you've seen this, you know, it's like, listen, if you want to go and do all the fine detail research, fine. But all I know is that I am seeing pretty, you know, very frequently male cyclists, uh, male runners. Um, I'm sure you're seeing them as well. There are plenty of them that are displaying reds, right? Um, and restricting what they're eating and, uh, you know, not in a good way and their bone health is not good. Testosterone is low end of normal. So for sure, it's a clinic. It is a clinical um uh, condition we're seeing in the male athletes, which is good. So we now have to recognize that. I mean, it's a little bit more tricksy in the males because, uh, you know, it, it does enter some awkward conversations. I mean, fortunately, I'm a doctor, so I don't, I'm not squeamish about this sort of thing, but you do have to ask men about morning erections. You know, that's the equivalent of having menstrual cycles in women. Mm. Um, so you do have to have those awkward conversations, but same, you know, male coaches and, and female periods. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, we have to get past that. And that's why it's some sort of questionnaire because then the person doesn't feel so confronted. They can just put it on a bit of paper. Yep. And, you know, yep. but, you know, you do have to know these sort of things and put it into um, context. And just as we've heard stories about the female runners and, you know, really bad stories, as we know from that training, uh, the Nike training camp um, and the disgraced coach, you know, equally, I know also there's a similar thing for male cyclists at the moment in Italy, where it's notorious that they, the cyclists go in there. They also get shamed about their shape in front of other uh, athletes and told they're fat and sort of, uh, you know, so listen, we have to be open about this and say, you know, the, the it affects male and female. And there are Unfortunately, there are some very bad cases in both for males and females where this is happening, still happening and happening quite recently. Um, but what we can do is just raise awareness and, you know, pick up these athletes. You and I were seeing them in the clinical context and give them the appropriate support and information they need to get back on track. You're listening to Dr. Nikki K on this and expert edition, sports and dance endocrinologist, deep diving on all things hormone health and performance for the athlete and performer. Support for today's show comes from Physiocrem. Physiocrem is a topical massage cream containing natural plant-based ingredients ideal for the temporary relief of muscular aches and pains. If you're conscious of what you put on your body, you'll be happy to know that Physiocrem does not contain parabens or hydroxybenzoates, and its non-greasy formula doesn't leave any sticky residue behind. Physiocrem can be found Australia-wide at your local Coles, chemist, 
or health store, as well as their online shop. They've offered listeners of the show 20% off the entire range over at physiogram.com.au. That's F-I-S-I-O-C-R-E-M.com.au. Hurting Sucks and Physiocram have got you back. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. Our philosophy is very simple. We simply want to help you get from pain or injury back to your physical best, completed rehabilitation, and across your physio finish line. To get there, we do not want to see you for a session more than what you require. We just want to see you get back to your physical best. To find out more about Pogo Physio's award-winning services, including our one-hour initial appointment, appointments or our very popular online telehealth consulting services, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back on this expert edition with Dr. Nikki Kay, sports and dance endocrinologist on all things hormones, health and performance for the athlete and performer. So someone's identified either themselves, they're like, okay, I've realize my cycle's irregular if I'm a female or you mentioned erectile function for males um, their own mood assessment perhaps their performance sporting performance is down uh, that they've gone to seek help there's a, a practitioner who's astute who recognizes this might be a factor uh, diagnosing reds per se uh, it, it's really a diagnosis of exclusion correct mm, exactly yeah you make a very good point I mean listen we can all you know, all of us were tired from day to day. I'm a bit tired this morning. <laughs> you know, I've had a tiring conference and, you know, things happen that we sometimes there are reasons why you're tired and you're not quite up to scratch. But again, it's kind of being honest with yourself and looking at it. I mean, my son, younger son, the triathlete, a couple of years ago, he was just really, really fatigued all the time and um, just wasn't performing, just didn't have the motivation. Um, and it turned out he had glandular fever, you see. So you're absolutely right. Diagnosis of exclusion, you know, common things occur commonly. So, you know, if an athlete presents their fatigue, maybe they got some injuries going on. Of course, the first thing is you do your normal clinical history. Maybe these these screening questionnaires that I'm talking about that I'm developing. So you ask the, the you know, the important questions about the, the menstrual cycles, if it's a woman, just get some background of what's going on. There may be a straightforward reason. This person has got loads of school exams, they're overdoing it, burning the candle at both ends, and, you know, that's that from the clinical history. But then the next step is doing some blood tests just to exclude the glandular fever, other medical bits and pieces, which may be causing irregular periods, um, you know, just to make sure you're not missing a medical condition that needs sorting out. Um, Once you've done that, as you say, then it ends up being a diagnosis exclusion. Then you actually now you can look at the functional aspects. And in the history, I'm always asking the athlete to just give me an outline of their training load. Give me an outline of what you're eating. Of course, they know exactly what they're eating because they've got it all logged and everything. Anyway, so you get you just get a feel for what they're doing. And then when all the tests come back and, and say they're clear, there's not, there's no glandular fever or any other medical condition, and then you look back and you and you say, well, yes, actually, now we can look at the your behaviours and look, you are, you're just not, uh, you're you're training, you're not eating sufficient to cover that fuel, and from the blood test, like there isn't a medical condition, but there are little clues on the blood test that you're in low energy availability, like the thyroid function is a bit. Uh, all the levels are down, testosterone is a bit down. I mean, the woman will have told you already if she hasn't got any periods, so therefore the estrogen will be low. So, you know, the blood tests not only uh, rule out things, but they also rule in things, you know, they they show evidence. Um, and if you can get a DEXA, if you really think that the person, uh, especially the amenorrheic woman, um, you know, then that will also give you an indication of where their bone health is at. And then uh, from that, then you can start to work with them and discuss how you're going to tackle this. I find myself more and more for people that present with, say, bone stress injuries in the endurance context, sending people where possible to actually get a check. And there's been quite a few occasions where their density is down. And it makes me think of one of your findings from your study looking at the DEXA scans of the the male cyclists. Can you paint a little bit of a picture? Because I remember... You, you citing that you were initially shocked at what you found with the density, yeah, the bone well, density of these 50 competitive cyclists. 
Yeah, well, I think I just want to pick up on what you said there, that actually, you know, physios are super important because often the athlete will present to you guys with, I mean, a bone stress injury, yes, or just niggly recurrent injuries. So actually the first port of call, you know, is often the physios actually, you know, are very astute at picking this up and then getting a DEXA to quantify what the bone health is. So the good thing about the DEXA is that that it's very low radiation. Um, It's it's less than a normal x-ray. The only thing, the only sort of thing I would really, if you, uh, whoever you are listening to this, when you get a DEXA, um, uh, make sure you get the two standard sites. In other words, the lumbar spine and the hip. And the reason we use those two sites is they're different, slightly subtle different types of bone. Uh, the lumbar spine is trabecular bone and the hip is cortical bone. And in general terms, in an athlete, um, apart from rowers, but we'll come to them in a minute, um, in general terms, especially runners, normally the hip won't be so bad because you are doing weight bearing there. But the lumbar spine, uh, even if you're uh, an endurance runner, and particularly if you're a cyclist, that type of bone is very sensitive to adverse hormone and nutritional factors. So in the cycling study, that's why we focused on the lumbar spine, because we know that's where the information lies. And I was surprised that pretty much half of the cyclists, they had low bone density for their age. And the uh, and to the extent of the level set by the IOC as being a warning sign. So we always compare uh, according to age because it would be very unfair to compare a 20-year-old's bone density to an 80-year-old, for example. So there's a system, and it's called the Z-score in when you get your DEXA back. It compares your value to other people of your age. And so if it's uh, low compared to the average population for your age, that's what's, that's a negative, that will come out as a negative Z-score. And IOC has said that set that negative Z-score as minus one, and that's in terms of standard deviations. And 44%, nearly half of my cyclists, had that low lumbar spine uh, bone density. So that was a bit of a worry. And that incl- that's all of them, because not all of them, by the way, some of them were fine. Some of them didn't have reds. But even including the ho- as the whole group, it was 50 of them of a decent level. So, you know, uh, yeah, so that was pretty, uh, pretty concerning. And, and if we think about it in that population, why does this matter? Well, as you say, they're not going to get stress reactions or bone stress injuries from uh, from cycling and riding a bike. But you know, I observe the falls, the crashes. Which uh, you yep. know, as living with cyclists yourself, there's that adage: you're not a true cyclist until you've come off X amount of times. Unfortunately, it's kind of inevitable. You know, the fracture rate for for cyclists. How much do you think that plays into into what happens? You know, when bo- cyclists come off. Sure. I mean, I think you're right. Like we said, you know, we we can never get an injury free world um and you know cycling is especially if you're cycling high speed down a you know down the descent you know and it's slippery then yeah you may come off and and you know the clavicle fracture is quite common so you know fair enough but the argument is i think that you're more likely to come off worse obviously if you've hit the deck and your bones are weak and the uh really if you look at the pro cycling stats for injuries they're all fractures, whereas if you looked at all of those for rugby, they're quite a lot of soft tissue. So number one, they are all fractures. Okay, you're going to say that's the nature of cycling. Fair enough. But the really nasty fractures are the vertebral fractures. Um, and in terms of the osteoporotic population, that is like pre, uh, you know, those, that's really significant, a vertebral crush fracture. These guys don't have a crush fracture necessarily, although I have seen one, by the way. But anyway, but when they fall off and if, if their spine, lumbar spines are weak and then they fracture, and that's really nasty because, of course, depending how severe it is, it will def- well, it's definitely going to mean time off the bike, full stop. And sometimes it even needs surgery. In fact, one of the cyclists that was, a- he was able to participate in the study, even though he's on a world tour team, is because he'd done this. He'd come off his bike um, and had quite severe Uh, vertebral fractures, which needed, um, you know, surgery. The surgeon had to put in stabilizing rods and bone grafts and all sorts of stuff. So you see what I mean? It's that, uh, that, that is because they won't, they won't get the early warning sign, but it would put some more at risk of getting a more severe fracture 
if they come off their bike. So that is so that's really the worry. And of course, then that's going to really put a kibosh on their performance because they can't train. Which brings up the you know the one of the final sort of uh, areas to explore, Nikki, on our, in our time together, and that's how reversible, how changeable is it if someone does get early warning signs uh if perhaps the only sign is a fractured vertebrae from a cyclist falling off uh, and then it's detected but you know what have you observed both clinically and through your research in terms of reversibility if you'd term it that of uh of low energy status for athletes performers well i think the good news is that there is evidence that it's reversible um certainly in the cycling study um if you remember i had i divide them into two groups some changed up what they were their nutrition and they did some skeletal loading exercises um and the other group who didn't they they were the ones that lost bone density and didn't perform so well but the ones that did take on those positive positive uh, behavioral changes uh they improved their bone density over the race season six months by two percent i mean that might not sound much but obviously you know if you then accumulate that over many months um you know potentially there there is uh there definitely you can change um conversely the other guys that lost it they lost the same amount of bone density in that short period as an astronaut in space on the international space station so you know that's it's encouraging so that's like the negative side of it if you don't change anything you just, you will go down full stop that's it no question but if you do take on board uh, and you are able to, you know, implement those changes, you can affect positive change. I showed that in the cyclists. Um, in terms of the nutrition, it's a combination. For the cyclists, especially, it's uh, the nutrition, obviously, is the key thing. But it's also the type of exercise. So they're not loading their skeleton. And I, at the conference yesterday, it was reinforced on us that actually doing, you know, weight exercise, weight bearing exercise, uh, you know, with obviously supervised free weights is great. And the multi-directional loading. So even the long distance, the long distance runner will turn around and say, hey, but I'm doing, I'm doing lots of weight bearing exercise, but actually it's all in one plane. And we discussed earlier that the body doesn't get bored with one stimulus. So you have to change it up. So you have to do multi-directional uh, loading, uh, and maybe you can probably explain that better than me as a physio. But you know, just changing in the cycling study, for example, we just had simple one-leg hopping, changing direction, and just doing that a few minutes every day has been shown in in old men that that improves their bone density. So I said to these young cyclists, look, if these guys can do it, you sure you definitely can. I know you don't like jumping and whatever, but you can just do a couple of hops, changing direction a few times a day. And that's easy peasy. There's no excuse. You know what I mean? So, so the positives on this are for the cyclists. Yes, they did improve their bone density and their performance. Um, in, in my clinical work in the women, uh, you know, Lots of them can. They have uh, regained their periods. Um, it's a frustrating. It's difficult because sometimes, you know, if you've been entrenched in that low energy availability, the metabolic rates really turn down. The, the You know, lots of the female athletes and dancers, they do get frustrated. They're phoning up saying, hey, I've been doing what you're saying. Well, they often say, oh, I've been doing what you're saying for the last week. My periods haven't come back. It's going to take a bit longer than a week. But nevertheless, some of them, you know, they've been going at this for several months. But it's just giving them, you look, you're going the right way. You have to do this. And if I could do a blood test, I can see there are little things are changing. It's like, come on, you've got to stick with this. And then eventually it comes. So it is patience, um, sticking with the nutritional plan, modifying the training. Don't go and blast it at high intensity right? That's just not, it's just an energy sapping thing. But please do do resistance training, multi-directional loading, because even even if you haven't been able to get a DEXA, or even if the DEXA doesn't look too bad, we know that your bones won't be happy, because that's one of the first systems that's affected, the bone turnover. Um, it just switches off if you're in low energy availability. So, that gives them mentally, that makes them feel better. Because if you're really love your sport or you're addicted, frankly, to your exercise, you know, it's not going to work. I know, you know, yeah, from a clinical point of view, you know how it is. If you say to them, no, stop exercising, it's number one, they won't do, they won't do that, by the way. And actually, it'll make them really, really sad. So I say, look, the deal is no high intensity, but here, here are some exercises. We gave them to the site. Here are some exercises. 
that um, you can do to strengthen your bones and actually will strengthen your muscles, you know, strengthen you anyway. Um, and so it'll be good for your performance. So a different type of exercise as well is important. So changing up the stimulus and uh, you know, as, yeah. if, as we loop full circle, it's about making your hormones work for you. And just curious, you've just returned from presenting there at the British Association of Sport and Exercise Medicine Conference. Any insight mm-hmm. into the risk of stress, bone stress injuries, so say stress reactions, fractures, uh, as it ties in with energy of energy deficiency or, or reds in athletes? Yeah, well, um, there was uh, – I showed a slide. It was by the PhD student, um, Ida of Louise Burke. I mean, Louise Burke, <laughs> very uh, prominent uh, Australian uh, research scientist. And uh, she uh, – Ida did a lovely study comparing um, eumenorrheic and amenorrheic athletes – and then for males, um, normal levels of testosterone and low-end levels of testosterone. And there was a marked difference between uh, two or more stress fractures, way more prevalent in the amenorrheic athletes and similar for the men, even, you know. So definitely we have – that. That was those were runners, endurance runners. So there's definitely clear evidence that, you know, <laughs> what we're talking about is real. OK, mm. um, that, you know, if you don't have periods in your female athlete, you will get stress, fra- more stress fractures than your counterparts who are having cycles. And same for the male uh, runners in this case. If you're in low energy availability and your testosterone is low end of the range, then you, again, you will be far more likely to get two or more stress fractures. So there's clear evidence that, you know, uh, yeah, this yeah, that, has a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. And I think sometimes that's the first, for many runners, uh, it's going to be the first warning sign is, hold on, yep. if you look at your injury chronology, we probably need to dig a little bit deeper than your training load here uh, in terms of what may yep. be going on. You're listening to Dr. Nikki K on this, an expert edition on all things health, hormones, and performance for athletes and performers. If you missed last week's episode, it was a look back at the best of our 2019 featured performers. Featured athletes included current World Triathlon Series champions Vincent Lewis and Katie Zafiris, US distance running couple Sarah and Ryan Hall, US marathon running star Meb Klavetsky, UK-based ultra trail runner Tom Evans, New Zealand marathon star Zane Robertson, and a host of others. To tune in to the best of the 2019 featured performers, jump over to wherever it is that you get your podcast from and enjoy the best of. Don't forget forget to visit one episode prior episode 196 to check out the best of the 2019 expert editions for now let's jump back with dr nikki k sports and dance endocrinologist on all things hormone health and performance for the athlete and performer Dr. Nikki Kay, you've been so generous with your time. And just finally here, uh, every guest of the Physical Performance Show does two things. One is to issue listeners with a physical challenge for the week. So what is Dr. Nikki Kay's physical challenge going to be firstly? Well, talking about changing stimulus and changing things up, do something, do a different form of exercise. So um, if you are an endurance uh, athlete, maybe I won't be quite so mean as to say go to a ballet class, but... <laughs> But do something because you're doing, you know, do something, do some Pilates, something different. Do something like that. Similarly, if you're a dancer, uh, you know, we sort said that cyclists don't like running. As dancers, we don't necessarily like doing – I'm a bit of an exception because I used to do swimming, but don't necessarily like doing, you know, real hard cardio. So if you're a dancer – get into the swimming pool, do some laps, uh, get out of breath or go for a cycle or something. I won't say run because anyway, but something to, so basically your, your challenge is on the theme of changing stimuli, try, do a different thing. Okay. Cause that will challenge you mentally. Cause if you like sticking into a little schedule, you won't like this. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Right, do something totally different. Um, just whatever. I mean, if you want to go to a ballet class, please, <laughs> uh, that would be great. But try something. Just do something different. Uh, that's 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 fantastic. And finally, uh, Dr. Nikki Kay, 
Uh, if you could boil everything you've learned through your extensive career to date, the research, the clinical work, your own uh, dancing interests and y- your family's sporting interests to one piece of advice to help listeners of this show perform at their own physical best, what would that solitary piece of advice be? I think it's what we've said already. Um, be true to yourself and listen to yourself. So don't compare yourself necessarily, oh, this other person does something, so I should do that. Uh, and actually, like we said, the subjective measures, you're, the person that knows you best is yourself. So be honest with yourself, you know, uh, and just keep a, either a log or something. Be aware. And if you really feel exhausted and a little bit under the weather, please don't train, you know. Um, so just listen to yourself. Uh, and if you're unsure, you know, sometimes it can be confusing. Then go and, you know, seek advice. Um if you've got a niggly injury, get it checked out. So you know what I mean? Because there could be something there that actually does need, you can do something positive about. So basically, listen to your own body. Be true to yourself. There you go. Ah, so powerful. Dr. Nikki K. Uh, if we want to find out more about all the great work uh, that you output, the educational tools, uh, where can we go to discover that? Follow the journey. Um, well, there's my own website called Nikki K. Fitness. And on there, it's got uh it's got my publications some blogs that i do um you know where i'm presenting next uh you know uh, i mean not that you guys in australia are going to come to london but if, <laughs> but you know i do clinics i have done skypes actually with people in australia but you know um it's, it's clinical advice all that sort of thing so that's my personal website i also wrote um the bayzem website called health for performance number four dot co dot uk and that's got um uh, educational it's got information about reds and it's split into various sections, athletes, coaches, parents, healthcare professionals. It's all the same information, but just couched in slightly different terms, because I think that's really important that we're all open. You know, um, uh, when I was writing that website, some scientist says, oh, no, we can't show them the medical stuff. It's like, no, we have to, because, you know, uh, the athlete needs to inform themselves and knows what to ask uh, the doctor, you know, if they're reluctant to do blood tests or something. Mm. So, um, so please have a look at there if you're concerned about reds, either for yourself or your training, you know, your fellow uh, athletes or, or whatever, or your children. Have a look on there. Um, yeah, I think those are the two main places. And I'm always writing blogs for BJ Sim. So if any of you healthcare professionals are out there, those are open access. The blogs are just open. Um, and I just wrote the recent one. Uh, of men uh, of men and mice <laughs> so uh, that's a little well when I say amusing I mean uh, I was quite pleased with the title but it's got some serious stuff in there so have a look at that uh, yeah so those are the three main places I would say yeah and recently taken to Instagram too at Nikki K Fitness oh yeah yeah I yeah. mean I'm not so super flash on the I'm, bit, I'm very old so I'm not so good at the social media but I try to stick a few bits and pieces on um, Insta and Twitter of course Facebook um, whatever your flavor, you know. Dr. Nikki K, you are prolific. And I want to say personally, thank you for the contribution you've made to the space. And, uh, and thank you also for the contribution you've made to the show. Well, listen, thanks so much for inviting me. It's been really fun discussing this. So there you have it. Another expert edition of the Physical Performance Show. And this year, we have some incredible experts coming your way. But I know and I trust you took a lot from Dr. Nikki Kay's generous sharings today. If you did, then please reach out and let Dr. Nikki Kay know what it was that you took from her sharings. You'll find Dr. Kay easily over on Instagram at Nikki Kay Fitness, N-I-C-K-Y Kay Fitness. And over at her website, NikkiKFitness.com. That's N-I-C-K-Y-K-E-A-Y fitness.com. Nikki's website really is the hub from which you can then link out to her research publications that she's been involved with. The British Association Sport and Exercise Medicine's Health for Performance website, which is a must for athletes and dancers and health practitioners, all designed to provide key tools, resources, and education around relative energy deficiency in sport for athletes and dancers. 
If you have a question for Dr. Nikki, jump over to the Physical Performance Show Facebook page. And of course, if there is someone in your world that you know needs to hear the teachings of Dr. Nikki K, then please share this episode with them. If you're enjoying the episode, consider a podsy, a screenshot of the episode you're enjoying and tagging in the show at Physical Performance Show. If you have any feedback regarding the show, you'll find me easily over on Instagram and Twitter at Brad underscore beer. And of course, if you are enjoying the show, then please consider a rating and review over on iTunes or wherever it is that you enjoy the show from. If you'd like the show into your earbuds each and every week, then simply hit subscribe from wherever it is that you enjoy this show from. Now, my top three learnings from Dr. Nikki's sharings were one, energy deficiency can be intentional and unintentional. Intentional energy deficiency includes orthorexia, disordered eating, and eating disorders, whereas unintentional energy deficiency can be born out of a failure to appreciate the energy demands of normal day-to-day life and the increasing energy demands and requirements of an increasing training workload. How often do we consider a doubling of our training hours or workload to also require a doubling of our energy intake? As I mentioned in the episode, I got it wrong for many years with some consequences as a result unintentionally being in a state, I suspect, of energy deficiency. Learning number two, athletes need to fuel for the work required. What a great teaching. If you are due for your long run, long ride, the next day, the the evening before's meal really is important, as Dr. Nikki shared, to make sure you're fueling for the work that will be required. Learning number three, you can get your hormones to work for you. I really like the concept of a hormone health triangle with nutrition, recovery, and training loads sitting at each of the corners and hormone health sitting in the middle. Jump over to social media in the coming days for an infographic on these top three learnings and feel free to share away with someone in your world that would benefit from them. A massive thanks to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week, Daryl Misson, our audio engineer, Susan Wilkin, all things show administration, and Matthew Walden on all things show graphic design. Of course, another huge thank you to this week's show sponsor, Physiocrem. Your support really does make the show possible. Jump over to physiocram, F-I-S-I-O.com.au to take advantage of 20% off all Physiocram products. Physiocram is the topical massage cream of choice at Pogo Physio, and if you're yet to try it, you will love the product. For links to all of Dr. K's handles, simply jump over to pogophysio.com.au and there you will find the show notes and all of the relevant resources and links mentioned in this episode. Now, coming up on next week's episode of the Physica Performance Show, we strap in for the first featured performer episode for 2020. And that is a featured performer episode with Australian dual Olympian, distance running star, 10,000 metre Rio Olympic Games finalist, David McNeil. At the time of recording, Dave had just completed the Zatapak 10,000 metre Australian titles with a very swift 28-16 for fourth place. And David has his eyes set on his third Olympic Games berth for the upcoming Tokyo 2020 Olympics. Dave shares around the highs, lows, and learnings of his career. And quite fittingly, following on from this week's expert edition around all things hormone health and performance and energy availability, Dave opens up on the years he spent in the injury wilderness as a result of not getting his energy availability needs met. It's a featured performer episode you're not going to want to miss until then keep pursuing and performing at your physical best i'm brad beer and this has been the physical performance show